Good morning. I'm Janet Blank, the president of the Advent Church Council. I want to welcome you to worship with us on the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. You'll notice that the readings this morning have to do a lot or mention food a lot. And this shouldn't be too surprising since God is concerned with the things that concern us and eating is about as basic as it gets. As you listen to the gospel reading and the sermon, I encourage you to think about the call and the opportunities we have to feed others. I'm thinking specifically about our partnership with Cross Lutheran Church and our participation in their food pantry and their meal program. I'm also thinking about how the Vacation Bible School families decided this year that they wanted to support the food pantry at, food, at Family Sharing in Grafton. When our parents and our kindergarten teachers encouraged us to share with others, they were really echoing the call that God has for us to do what we can to help feed others. During the worship, Pastor Alexis will consecrate the bread and wine and grape juice, God's body and blood, so that we can partake this holy meal together. You will have this opportunity after the sermon and the prayers. If you need to pause this video to get your elements together, feel free to do so. You may use bread or a cracker and grape juice, wine, or water. We also have small communion packets of bread and grape juice available inside the church doors throughout the week. And we put that those small packets outside on the weekends. And this morning, Pastor Alexis will be out in front of the church from 9, 30, 9 to 10.30 this morning to offer a blessing, to get to know people, to introduce herself, and to pray with any of those people who would like to do that. She does ask that you will come masked and do social distancing as she will be doing. I want to take a moment to remind everybody that even though our church building is closed for worship, our congregation is still active and ministry is happening. Property team, member care, staff support teams are all working on projects to strengthen the ministries of Advent, to improve our building, to connect members to other members. The prayer chain is still active. The AA groups meet every week in small groups. The youth are meeting over Zoom and VBS is happening virtually for families in our community. And we are worshiping together here right now. And so in all of this, if you haven't made an offering to the church lately, I ask you to prayerfully consider doing so. Some of you are dropping off or mailing in your offerings. Thank you. Some of you have signed up for online giving through Vanco. Again, thank you. If you would like to give online, you can do so through our website at adventchurch.org and then click on the online giving tab at the top. And you could always contact us in the office if you have questions, but please continue to support this church and her ministries with your offering gifts today. And now I invite you to take a moment to center yourself before worship. Please join Pastor Alexis as she leads us in praying the prayer of the day found in your Celebrate insert. Welcome to worship. Let us pray. Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies body and spirit, and with this food fill all the starving world through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hi there, this is Nathan Wagner, and today I'll be reading a lesson from Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 5. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that you do not know shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. 
for he has glorified you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The gospel this morning comes from Matthew, the 14th chapter. As soon as Jesus heard the news about the beheading of John the Baptist, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them and healed the sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, That isn't necessary. You feed them. Lord, we have nothing but five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then Jesus told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven, and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterwards the disciples picked up twelve baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The feeding of the 5,000. Boy, this is a great story, isn't it? It is one of my favorites. And I think I love it because it is just so unimaginable. I mean, don't you think so? Think about it. In this story, nothing computes. It doesn't work out. It's bad math. No matter how hard you try to imagine it, Two fish and five loaves just can't do what this gospel says that they do. Um, even if you imagine the largest game fish you've ever seen, 2,000 pound swordfish, and even if you imagined bread loaves the size of small tables, nevertheless, that would not be enough food to feed 5,000 people. 5,000 men, not including the women and children, which could have doubled or tripled. Let's say there were 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 people gathered at the seashore that day. Two fish and five loaves. It doesn't compute. Do you know how long it takes for 15,000 people to be fed? And how much food would be needed to do that? I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of attending the ELCA's National Youth Gathering, but I've been able to do that on a couple of occasions. And at those youth gatherings, there are 30,000 people gathered in a stadium, and when we're there for worship on Sunday morning, 30,000 people need to be communed. You can imagine the logistical gymnastics that have to happen to make that work, and it does. They are able to commune 30,000 people in a half an hour, but it takes 500 communion assistants, hundreds of loaves of bread and chalices with people who have organized explicit directions of where in the stadium, which exits and entrances to go to, and carefully choreographed movement in order so that everyone can get communed, can get fed. And you know what? That is not what happened at the lakeshore. They didn't have hours and hours of planning. They didn't have 500 or more um, people to distribute. No, Matthew tells us that Jesus had everyone sit down on the grass and then his disciples, 12 guys, distributed the broken pieces of bread so that everyone could eat. And they did it so that every last person was able to get some. And not just get some, 
But miraculously, these two fish and five loaves was enough for everyone. Enough for everyone to be fed, to eat as much as they wanted, Matthew tells us. And then there was leftovers, not just a few crumbs, but 12 baskets of leftovers. Now, no matter how you compute it, these numbers just don't add up. There is no way that 2 plus 5 distributed by 12 feeds thousands of people. No way they could do it without taking hours and hours to do so or without tons of extra help. But the thing is, we don't do the computing here. Left to our math, left to our devices, left to how our thinking would organize this, it wouldn't work. But Jesus does the math. Jesus doesn't rely on basic math or algebra. Instead, he uses God math. And in God's math, there is no exact equating, no pinching of pennies, no number crunching. In God's math, there is abundant accounting. And we see it time and time and again in scripture that God's activity in the world is described as abundant and bountiful and magnificent and extravagant. And in Isaiah, in the lesson that Nathan read for us today, God's activity and love and grace and mercy in this world is described as rich, good food that delights and satisfies us and is beyond price. A table where all can get their fill, where everyone who is thirsty gets drink and everyone who is hungry is fed. God is so good, so good to us. Isaiah tells us that God does all of this for us because God wants life for us, wants us to live. But it's not just that God wants us to live, to live a meager, basic existence, not just any kind of life, but God wants that we have abundant life. God wants us to live into the fullness of the blessings that we have been given. That's why on the shore that day, the masses didn't just receive a sliver of bread to tide them over, but they received enough to eat their fill, to eat as much as they wanted and as much as they needed. Abundant accounting. Now that doesn't mean that we don't struggle. It doesn't mean that we won't have financial issues, struggle to pay our bills, or make ends meet. It doesn't even mean we won't hunger or thirst. I mean, the crowds were poor and hungry in the gospel today. No, abundant life isn't just about how much money is in our pockets or what is saved in the bank. It's about how we account for the blessings that God has given us already and the blessings that God is promising us. It's about fullness. It's about being satisfied, about being delighted. But I struggle with the math. I will admit that sometimes I struggle to see the abundance and I struggle even more learning to expect abundance. So I suppose the characters that I identify the most with in this story are the disciples because they struggle with God's math. In Matthew's gospel, they struggle the whole way through to understand how God computes, how the world works, the equation that makes it all happen. They don't get it. And sometimes I don't get it either. They haven't learned yet to trust in God's abundant accounting. That day, they watched as the sun started to set and as the crowds started to get hungry and cranky and antsy. 
And they had compassion too. I'm certain of it. I'm certain they wanted to make sure that everyone was cared for, that they, that they, that they wanted these people to be well. They knew that that was Jesus' purpose, but they also knew their limits. And they knew that they could not feed those people. That is what they knew. In the other Gospels, as they tell this story, the disciples explained that it would cost 200 denarii, six months worth of wages, in order to feed that many people. And they knew they didn't have that kind of money, so there was no way, there was no way that they could make this happen. It didn't compute. But Jesus doesn't see scarcity or limitations like we do. Jesus tells them not to send the crowds away, but instead instead insists you feed them. But with what? They wondered. They desperately tried to explain that they don't have anything to feed anyone with. Well, except for these two fish and five loaves. Sure, we've got that, but that's nothing. And Jesus says, see what I can do with your nothing when you put it in my hands. I wonder if you've ever felt like you had no way of making a way when it was needed. I wonder if, if you've ever felt um, that you were facing a situation that you were completely unprepared for, like you had nothing to give like you had nothing of value to offer, if you ever worried that you could never be enough or have enough to get you through. I wonder if you've worried that the church didn't have enough or couldn't be enough to get through. Sometimes we get caught and stuck in these equations that don't compute and we can't figure it out. It's problems that numbers just can't seem to fix. They don't fit. They don't work. But friends, God sees what we can't see. God knows what we can only dare to imagine. And God wants for us not just some pie-in-the-sky promise of life after death, but God's desire is for life abundant life here, now, for you and for me. Real goodness, real bread, real drink, the real things in life that sustain us and fill us with all joy and hope. God promises life abundant. And it comes out of God's deep and abiding love for us. God sees our needs just as Jesus saw the needs of those gathered that day and has compassion for us. That's what Jesus gave the crowds of people gathered that day, not just a morsel of food to get them through the night, but enough good food to not just fill their bellies, but to fill their spirits with joy and hope. And so I look around. I look around and like the crowds gathered in hunger that day, I see a world where kids are still separated from their parents at the border. And black and brown neighbors across the country are protesting for their lives to matter. And I live and see in a world where diabetics can't afford their insulin and people can't afford to go to the doctor or pay for food for their kids. A world where people are bullied because they don't fit people's norms of gender or orientation or body or wealth or culture. And in a world where churches are worried that they've become irrelevant And it's hard to wade through the world's fake news in order to find the truth. We live in a world where parents are agonizing over whether they should send their kids back to school or keep them home. And people are fed up with wearing masks. And the unemployment rate is higher than ever. 
And I wonder, with all of that, what is God's equation? What is God going to do with all of those factors? How will it compute? If two loaves and five, uh, two fish and five loaves in the hands of a dozen disciples can abundantly feed, nourish, and give hope to thousands, what would God's abundant accounting look like today for us? Because God doesn't just want the bare minimum for us to just help us get by. God wants more, promises more, more than adequate, more than okay, more than enough of goodness, real blessing in real life. God promises abundant life, promises that families will be safe, protected, and whole, promises that all lives can't matter until black and brown lives, the most vulnerable lives, matter to us, and that all people are worthy of dignity, justice, freedom, power, and love. God doesn't want us to just live, but wants us to have health and wellness and opportunity. Wants that we will know our value and know our worth, that we are beloved children, that nothing can separate us from God's love. God wants the church to be a place of hope where all people know love regardless of whether the building is open, but to be a place that speaks mercy, care, and compassion in times of need. God wants that we would support all families so that everyone can be safe, so that children can learn and grow and play and thrive. God wants that we will use our lives to make a difference, to care for the world and the people that God has made. God is never stingy with blessing. God's math might not compute in our way of thinking, but in God's economy, abundant accounting always works out. In our accounting, we often think too small, where we only know limitations and our own nothingness to offer. Jesus knows our possibility. Where we can't see beyond the brokenness of the world, Jesus makes things whole. Where we can only see that the numbers don't add up, Jesus sees abundant accounting where God's grace, mercy, and love are added to every equation. And thanks be to God for that. And every Sunday, every Sunday when we gather, we are reminded of God's abundant accounting. Every Sunday, though separated by distance, we are connected through worship, through prayer, through the partaking of a meal. Every Sunday, our limited offerings support ministries that build up and empower and care for one another. And every Sunday, we share in the feast that Jesus created out of nothing. We participate in a meal that has no end. Each time that bread is broken and wine is poured, we celebrate the God who adds grace to every occasion and every equation. We celebrate the God who solves every problem that we can't work out with love and compassion. And we celebrate the God who will never leave us hungry or wanting, but satisfies us and fills us with abundant blessings. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to join us in the singing of our hymn of the day, entitled The Table of the Lord. You might recognize the voices of this song, it is sung by the Advent Lutheran Church Choir from their 2001-2002 CD. 
I hope you enjoy. The lyrics are printed. Feel free to rewind and sing again as you become more familiar with the song, The Table of the Lord. will run to you and that nations who do not know you 
will find their joy in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Hear the anguish of tender hearts who cry to you in suffering and satisfy their deepest needs. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body, heart, soul, and mind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer freely the fullness of salvation. Give our congregation, Advent Lutheran Church, a welcoming heart that our words and actions may extend your free and abundant hospitality to all whom we encounter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those today, O oh God, who are born too early and those who die too soon, for unexpected illness and the challenges that are faced by many. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember today, O oh God, our brother Easter from Cross Lutheran Church in Milwaukee, who will this week be having eye surgery. We pray for skilled doctors and nurses and for quick healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We now pause to offer you our own prayers, whether spoken aloud from our homes or in the silences of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You gather your saints as one, united in one body of Jesus. Bring with us all your saints to this heavenly banquet. We remember with love and thanksgiving the saints we have known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ensure in certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love. We offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It is now time, friends, for us to partake in Christ's abundant feast. It is that time for you to begin to gather the elements at home as I prepare here. I invite you to grab your bread or crackers and your grape juice or wine or water. And as I say the Eucharistic prayer, consecrating these elements, you may hold your hands over the elements that you have in your home as an act of reverence, receiving God's blessing of the bread and wine. After the words of institution and the Lord's Prayer, you will be invited to partake in this abundant feast and then to share uh, this bread and this wine or grape juice with those in your home. As you do so, giving the bread, say, the body of Christ given for you. And when you share the wine or the grape juice or the water, saying the blood of Christ shed for you. And after we have communed, I will speak a prayer of thanksgiving and offer a blessing. O oh God, you have called us to the table of the Lord, a table where we are not only filled with all good things, but where God's love and forgiveness flow freely. We are called to the table of the Lord where all people of every time and every place are welcome. We are called to the table of the Lord, just as the disciples were called on that night in which Jesus was betrayed. And it was there at the table that he took bread and he gave thanks and he gave it for all to eat saying this is my body given for you do this for the remembrance of me and again after supper he took the cup 
And he gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood, and it is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And every time we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we remember Christ's promise of life, of abundant life. So now I invite you to join with me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, friends, welcomed at this wide table of mercy where Christ is our host, you may now eat and drink and receive the abundant blessing of Christ's body and blood. For you, the body of Christ given for me, and the blood of Christ shed for me. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his peace. Amen. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth, sustained by these bountiful gifts, that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. And receive now this blessing. People of God, live into God's economy of abundant mercy. Bring justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. Care for the widow and the orphan. And share the abundant life that Jesus offers to the world around us until he comes again. And may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit encourage and strengthen us as we go.